Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, Historic Preservation Board for Thursday, October 7th, 2021 at 530. And um, I, Joan Belgiorno, Chair, I will call the meeting to order. Um, and we'll do the minutes first since. Before we do the minutes, Joan, I'd like to uh, add a couple of items on the agenda under new business that okay. did not get to you. Um, we do have a discussion regarding agricultural fencing on, on historic districts. Um, you had sent in a uh, article regarding uh, climate change as it relates to historic preservation. We can talk a little bit about that as one of the items. And then finally, I'd like to just give you a brief update on the status of the Clark House. Of the, oh, Clark House, yep. okay. And with that, if you want to move forward, we can do that. And also, we have a guest this evening. Um, I, I don't know if you're going to be uh, a bystander or if you're going to uh, discuss, but that, there will be a point to discuss if you want. We have Mr. Ron Reitz with us from 1689 Scribner Road. Okay. You know, the Reitz family, they've been here many, many times. <laughs> yes. So with that, we can move forward with your, uh, your approval. Okay, um, so we are approving, since we haven't met in so long, the minutes from uh, July 1st, 2021. Has everybody had a chance to look at them? Okay. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next order of business is, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Shannon Barr. She is... Um, Proposing to be the new clerk to the board in 2022. She is also uh, a member of our building uh, inspection team and code compliance. Okay. And maybe I can just let you talk a minute about yourself and what your background is, with, is why you want to be involved with the historic preservation board. Sure, yeah, so I'm currently um, assistant building inspector for the town of Penfield. Um, I do building inspecting, code enforcement, and I do assist the fire marshal from time to time. So wear a lot of hats. Um, I have a background in historic preservation. Um, I studied, uh, studied it in college. Uh, I have a degree in architectural studies with a fo focus in historic preservation. Um, I've worked at a historic preservation focused architecture firm, um, and I do have a light background uh, in land surveying as well. Great. Obviously an upgrade from what you're dealing with now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So she will be, uh, hopefully she will be joining you as your clerk uh, in 2022. I wanted to get her in for at least one or two meetings or three meetings if we could this year just to get a feel for, to meet the board and then also look, learn the process as to how we do the minutes and all that other business. So okay. welcome. welcome. Thank you. All right. Um, we do have public participation. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything at this point in time or just hold off for a period of time and we'll, we'll go on. Okay. Very good. Um, we have no action items. Um, we did talk about one of the reasons to get together is, as you noted, we have not been together in a long time. I thought it was good to get together uh, just so we remember who, what everybody looks like. But secondly, uh, just to get a, a feel for starting a discussion, it doesn't have to happen tonight, but starting a discussion regarding what you'd like to see happen in 2022. I know Kathy's been vocal over the last year or two about the possibility of doing some kind of program with you um, as a town historian, uh, similar to what we did a few years ago, uh, where we brought in people to talk a little bit about historic preservation issues, such as window treatments and, you know, how to paint properly and that type of thing. I don't know if the board has anything in mind at this point in time, but it's probably a good opportunity to talk a little bit about that and just get a feel for everybody who wants to be in 2022. Okay, yeah, Kathy and I have been talking about it for a while, and we were hoping to do a second, some type of public seminar, and then COVID hit and nothing happened. But I don't know how um, people feel about that. It, I, I guess our opinion, Kathy, was that it was pretty successful the first time we did it, right? And I think it would help pe when I was out looking with with Spurgeon King's old um, survey from years ago to some of the places that I didn't even remember, even though I was on the board then, um, there's obviously a lot of people that we never ever hear from. Um, there, you know, and if if there was enough uh, marketing of of an event, you would we drew in a few um, new people last time, so that. People will not see us just as a enforcement board, but someplace to come 
when they want to do something to their property and they're not sure how to do it. I mean, you know, we always refer people to the to the local history room, but and um, it, Kathy's the one that actually gave me the. Uh, information she had gotten from a seminar, which we were going to talk about later, and that has a lot in it <laughs> uh, about sustaining historic properties in this environment that we live in, be it weather or whatever it is. And so that could be a focus, too, of of the types of things you could do with a historic uh, with a historic uh, structure that you hadn't even thought of, some of which are very simple, like you know heating kinds of things and and that type of thing. Does anybody have any other thoughts on it? How did we advertise the last time? I don't remember. Um, it was it was on um, the t our TV station. And it was on uh, the town of Penfield website. And did we send we sent a mailing? We had an article in the paper too. Right, but didn't we send a mailing to? Um, I I'm trying to remember how broad it was. It was sent to. Um, it was a postcard sent to each of the property owners within the district, and also within uh, if you had an historic uh, landmark that was outside the district but was on its own. Right. Everybody in those in those situations received uh, notice from us, and we had good attendance. I mean, we had a lot of people. Right. Um, you know, one of the areas that I had looked at just in, independently was the area up on um, Old Penfield Road um, as you're heading toward Brighton, and there's several historic properties there that I don't think. Anybody but the owner, people who know the owner have been in, you know, and they they don't have a reason. They're not in a preservation district. You know, it's not a landmark house, but potentially some of them, particularly as the years go on, 1920s houses become something that, you know, we might want to look at. So identifying even areas like that and just mailing something to that particular area um, might be helpful. To, to draw new people in and to get new board people as time goes on. I mean, some of us have been here a long time. <laughs> what about what about putting on like seminars that focus strictly on certain topics? Right. Well, I you know, so if you're going to paint your house, they can come in and ask for advice of what is suggested. Right. Stuff like that. Paint and windows, I think, was one of the two things. We had Steve Jordan come, was one of the two things that had come out of that last seminar as very popular yeah. topics. So even if you can't, you know, always have a seminar because we're a small group, um, a creation of resources that people sure. can, you know, hear. Mm -hmm. These are the places in this county, for example, where you could get help. I mean, it takes an extra, it takes a meeting or two outside of our monthly meeting because rarely, with COVID aside, we don't usually have a meeting where there's no applications at all. So you would have to, you know, a, a smaller group maybe would have to meet maybe at Kathy's place over there. <laughs> Some kind of a subcommittee to set everything up. Yeah, so I would see that as a goal when, we are comfortable enough with COVID, et cetera, that we would be inviting people to come to an event. Where did we have the last one? Um, right here? It was right here. Right here. Yeah. And how many, 60 people, maybe 50? I don't remember. I'd say there were about 50 people. Though. Yeah, right. Beside uh, informing and having seminars so that people can actually learn things that would be useful, I think it's important just to recognize the owners of the historic buildings right. and recognize their, um, the effort they've put into saving them. Right. It's nice to be appreciated. So right. I think that's a, good, that's a good part of it. And, you know, there's always going to be people that are leery that you're going to want to um, about being something being forced on them. But if it's just, you know, honoring or voluntary mm -hmm. and information, it will maybe make them a little more at ease if they do have to get permission for something. 
Very good. So that, uh, those are some of the things we're thinking about. Um, obviously, there are other things that we could come up with as well. Um, even just maybe conducting tours or, or, or just driving tours of homes for the public mm -hmm. to participate in if they wanted to, something of that nature. I've, I've also thought of um, uh, an audio tour where somebody could, could pick up um, something at the town hall or it can be downloaded to your phone. You know, with, obviously you can't do the whole town all at once, but you can do the preservation district to start with. Then you know, and what about what about those of us who grew up here in Penfield talking about Penfield the way it was when we were kids? Yeah, that's that would be great. I would think somebody coming to a seminar would love to hear that. We, but we, Tom, Tom would talk about it, right? We all grew up together. <laughs> been here a long time. You know. Can we talk about the things you two did when you were kids? Some of it. <laughs> you want that on video? No. I mean, but, but I remember when Penfield was two lanes. Right. I remember way back there. So. And I've been here 50 years. I can't talk from my childhood, but I can tell you there was no Wegmans. Yeah. <laughs> there was a drugstore on Five Mile Line Road. There was, mm. you know, all kinds of... I remember when Five Mile Line was a two-lane highway uh, and it was Atlantic Avenue at the intersection last week. <laughs> you know, when I worked for the county, I had to visit a family in uh, Woolworth. And I lived in West Aronicoit, and I was new to Rochester. I think I was 25. And there was no GPS. So I had to get out the map and figure where the heck Walworth was. And when I hit the hill on Linton now, coming down and going, where the heck am I going? You know, <laughs> I had no idea. It seemed like the other end of the earth. So it's certainly, times have changed in, in uh, all those years. Absolutely. Some of the other things we have to talk about, too, are just uh, basic uh, administrative stuff is everybody still comfortable with Thursday nights, first Thursday night of the month? And is everybody comfortable at 5.30 versus going back to 7 o'clock? It does create a problem if we go back to 7 o'clock because there's so many meetings that the PCTV's got a video now. Um, we run into conflict with a couple of other places. So if it's convenient for you, I mean, I know you guys come from downtown. That's not the easiest thing in the world to do. But if you're comfortable with that. They we, stop construction. It's yeah, once we get that done, it'll be easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But if well, you, if and you're the comfortable winter with it. is harder because you you run into weather issues, you know. And exactly. I think, it, and it also gets the board home earlier. It gets the it gets the applicants and the residents that are interested home earlier as well. And I, you know, I know we've discussed how it would affect the board, but has anybody? You think it's an issue for applicants? Well, it hasn't been yet, and he's one of our long-standing applicants, and he made it here with no problem. So no, I, I'm just saying because of people's work I, I don't think so. That's it. why I wanted to do it at 5.30 uh, later, at least get people a chance to get in and get, get here. Um, I know it's not the easiest thing in the world if you're working downtown. you got to get out of downtown first. But right. um, so far, I think it's been okay. Um, I haven't had any complaints. Um, of course, we had Zoom that was helping us do right, that, right. Um, and we may, who knows, we may go back to Zoom again at some point in time here. Um, the governor did extend the uh, order, the governor order, to, to allow it. Um, I think that as long as everybody's comfortable, we can still do this in person. I think it's better in person. Right. But it, 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 it may go back to Zoom at some point in time. Right. We don't know. There's an order for Zoom? Jim. We can it be a combination of in person anymore. and um, it, it very well may be. I, I'm going to have to check into that. Um, I thought I'm, there was a problem with that. If you, <laughs> if you, for or we're subject to open meetings law, right? Right. I thought that under open meetings law, that if you did it some on and some off, that any place where there was a board member. You had to be open. That's what I'm concerned yeah, about because right. you're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, that board member has to be able to visually see the people that they're and, interviewing. And so, like, and, if somebody could, cut, if you're doing it at your house, somebody could exactly. go to your house and say, "I want to be at the meeting." Well, and, I guess legally you're right. Yeah, um, that's I, why I really I, I do want to get it. I know for the back. legislature. I don't know if it's for everybody. No, I think you're on the right track, and that's why I've been, you know, insistent upon getting everybody back together. I, I personally do not want to go back to Zoom unless it becomes a real issue where we have to. Um, I think it's good to get the board members together. I think it's good to get the applicants in face to face versus having to just look at you electronically. So uh, right now, I think this is what, the way we're going to handle this for the time being. And 
if everybody's good with 530, um, right. it's, it, it could be a little bit easier and for I, everybody. And I would suggest maybe that informally, if somebody goes, oh, 530, you say, well, I'll put you on the end of the yeah. agenda. Yeah, anything you we know, can do to accommodate just, the public, we'll do that. So it would be like it. 6 o'clock maybe yep. when they actually came before the board. And, you know, in the past, you've also rescheduled meetings to accommodate applicants and, um, right. and board members that couldn't be at the meeting. So those things all come into play as well. I would have never made 5.30 from my schedule when uh, I was working downtown. Yeah, I know. I wouldn't have either, actually, when I was down there. It, was, it would not right. have worked out. But in any event, um, we'll, we'll keep plugging away on it, see how it goes, and if we have any problems, we'll have to work through those problems and get you to a point where okay. you're comfortable. Anything else on, uh, on that at this point in time? We probably should start thinking about some of these programs for next year. Um, we have two more meetings this year to formulate some plan. So I did want to get started now so that you had some time to think about it and right. kind of get, get moving on it. Um, any other the comments on that? Okay. We have a guest tonight. Ron's with us. Um, Ron and uh, the building department have been going back and forth a little bit over the last week or so. Um, and I didn't really want to make this, I want to make this more of a generic issue than I did a specific one, but you were kind enough to come, so I guess we'll include you into it now at this point in time. So Ron came to, well, actually Ron didn't come. Ron is interested in creating a garden in his backyard, and I'm going to let him talk in a minute about that, but he's interested in creating a garden in his backyard. Obviously, um, there is an issue with uh, deer and all sorts of other issues out there in terms of uh, attacking the garden. He wanted to put up a fence uh, to accommodate, I'm gonna get rid of that, to accommodate um, protection of, of the garden area. And he started putting posts in. Uh, this is not his, by the way, as a matter of fact, I was gonna keep this quite generic because it's not just you, it's anybody else that wanted to do this that has an historic home. But in any event, he wanted to put up, and this may not even be the exact thing that you wanna do, and you can certainly comment when you want to, but he wanted to put up an eight foot high fence uh, surrounding his garden area, which is probably about maybe the size of a tennis court, I would think, or a little bit bigger maybe, but that big. And the question came up from the building department, what can you do, not just in an historical property, but on any property, if you're not really an agricultural operator, such as um, this one right here, which is uh, Shoots uh, Apple Farm, or your Wickhams where you got tons of acreage and you need to put these things up around the perimeter of your property. Can you do this um, if, you're, if you're not at that level, but you certainly do have an area of five acres which he has on his property, um, can he put up higher fencing um, eight feet in height at this particular point? The building department initially looked at the fencing as being six feet in height uh, because he's not truly an agricultural operator in their eyes, or initially didn't think so. But when they started looking at the ordinance as it relates to customary agricultural operations, fencing as it relates to, and I've got the ordinance, which I think I shared, fencing for agricultural use, um, they have kind of come to a little bit of an impasse as to what they think uh, he should be entitled to, because now they're saying that the ordinance is not that strong as it relates to definitions for farm. We don't even have a farm definition. We have an agricultural operations definition. And, and if you look at our, if I can pull it up here for you, look at our fencing ordinance. That's what we've got here. You look at our fencing ordinance, it deals with single family residential, obviously, and that's where the six foot came from. But then you start talking about agriculture, and as I say, it's very loose as to how agriculture is dealt with in our ordinance at this point in time. Um, it talks about, uh, let me get there for you. Talk about barbed wire, you can't have barbed wire fencing for agricultural purposes unless it's protected from the public. Yeah. Get me there. Okay. 
and this is what we're this is where defenses uh, need to provide entry into, which could be hazardous to the health, safety, or welfare of persons. Uh, that's not the one I want, though. I want it. I want it. It talks about agricultural use. And. And the definition of agricultural what use. He, what does he say? There is it's no agricultural what? fence definition or agricultural use definition. There's an, a customary agricultural operation that says if you have five acres of land or more, you can conduct agricultural operations. If you have five acres or less, you can do uh, agricultural operations. So it, it's, it was meant to allow for people to grow something on their property, and then if they wanted to put a little farm stand out front of their house, which some people uh -huh. do uh -huh. still, it gave them the opportunity to sell from the site what they grew on the property. But it doesn't say that they can fence it in? It, it doesn't say that they can't fence it in. And that the building inspectors are now coming to a little bit of an impasse. They initially said, you gotta, you gotta stick with a six foot high fence. But now they're reading this in more detail and they're saying, we don't really have the strongest ordinance in the world as it relates to somebody who wants to put an agricultural fence on their property even though they don't have the five acres. And what do other towns in our area. I don't know at this point in time. This just kind of came up this last week and we're wrestling through it. Um, uh, where we are right now, I think the building inspectors were saying, how would the Historic Preservation Board handle uh, or in their minds determine that fencing is appropriate um, if it's, and we're not talking about fencing going around the perimeter of the property. We're talking about fencing that's interior too, right. similar to some of the things even his neighbor has done. Um, at the corner of five mile line and uh, Five Mile Line and Scribner Road, uh, this property has put up fencing for agricultural purposes. Um, this is on Atlantic Avenue. This is on Scribner Road. You can kind of see, oops. The property you just showed though, that's not a, that's a that's it's not, not designated. It's not designated. I mean, it, it would be eligible for designation. And but how it's tall not. is, I can't, I can't see very well, far. It's so about six feet. Six feet, yeah. okay. I guess for, it would be irrelevant to us as a board on fencing because we have to look at each case individually. So in the case, like if you're putting in a vegetable garden in the backyard of a historic home, would the vegetable garden be something that was typical to that home? If well, it's an old farmhouse? Every person has a right to grow stuff. No, but, that, but that's not our, that's not our, no. Our, we would look at it and say, is this garden part of the historic part of the house? And then therefore, how do you protect that garden? I, I don't think we can do that. Yeah. I think we can say, is the fence appropriate there or no, not? No, you're not listening garden. to what I'm saying though. I'm saying if we think the garden is appropriate to the house and the only way to protect the, the garden is through the fence, then I think we could, we could say that the, the fence is appropriate because the garden is part of what the house would have been like. But it's that, it, it, uh, are you saying that every garden on a house that is historic has to be a historically designed garden? Or just that you can... Not necessarily. I don't think vegetable gardens were historically designed. I mean, I think they're just vegetable gardens. But um, I mean, you said that you could... Does the garden go with, with the property? If it's an old farmhouse, then most likely they did have a garden. Is the, is the basic issue the eight, eight feet versus six? It is. Uh, because first of all, well, the, there's two issues. Number one, it's the eight versus six, and we're we're not there yet. We, he may be entitled to an eight foot fence, depending on the way our ordinance is written. We're wrestling through that right now. The other part of it is, if if he were allowed to have uh, an eight foot fence, um, does the board have to approve it? Because it's it's dealing with an agricultural use on the site. It's not a permanent structure. Or would you have to, would you have to review it and, and address it as a, as an issue uh, for compliance? That permanent was my the thought that went through my head because we have I can't think of what it is right now, but we've approved things that aren't permanent just on the basis that they're not permanent. Well, you look at uh, yeah, I, and, <laughs> and if you look at our ordinance, it does call for um, the board to review fencing. It doesn't specifically say agricultural fencing. I think the intent really was if you were going to put a fence around the perimeter of your property, like you just mentioned earlier, over on Wayland and Five Mile Line, 
certainly you had to review that fence because that's going to probably be a permanent fence that's going to be there for a long, long time. And the design feature, you, know, you had to approve that. Right. Um, so what type of fencing are we talking about that we would think people would most often ask for? for, for well, for the garden, the garden. issue, I, I think it's going to be these kinds of situations where you have, you know, you could have a chicken wire fence. And, and in the past, I don't, I've never brought anything like this to you because with chicken wire fencing, right, right. this, this kind of came about because this is the kind of fencing I think, and I'm going to let him talk a little bit about it, but it's the kind of fencing that you would see over at Chutes or you would see at um, Wickham Farms that he'd like to protect, you know, his, his crops. So the other question is, would you prevent him from having an eight foot fence so that he couldn't protect the crops uh, with a six foot fence? A six foot fence, I assume eight foot fence protects it. A six foot fence, six foot fence, the deer still get in there. Is that the issue? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but uh, on uh, Old Penfield Road on the left hand <coughs> side, um, past Gentles, is that I, I always think of it as like uh, a fairy tale house, that little tiny house with the big lot next to it. And they. I don't know what they're growing inside the fence. I don't think they want people to know what they're growing inside the fence. But they put up like a solid white. Uh, it's not. It's a. You know. It's a. It's an older home, but it's not a landmark house. Right. So they put a circular giant white fence that's all enclosed and you can't see through, with the concept I guess that, that something was growing in there and it must be only six feet tall but it is you can't see through it which doesn't seem to me to necessarily for example if you don't discuss what kind of fence you could put there I don't think that fence is particularly attractive but nobody would ask me that because it's not my you know it's not my job to, to figure that out but well, why don't we get more information that this is kind of where the public participation part of the meeting comes into play. Why don't you come on up and talk, the, just give an idea of what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish, and why you're going where you're going with this. Your name and address. Ron Reitz, 1689 Scribner Road. Thanks for having me tonight. You're welcome. Um, so yeah, I, the whole thing started, I went to, uh, well, came to the town hall and there you guys hand out a nice sheet uh, referencing fencing and in fact I have a copy of it um, it gives <coughs> guidelines for fencing you don't need a permit for fencing um, unless there's some s special circumstances I believe a pool fence uh, a permit is required but regardless that wasn't my issue in, or my case so I didn't mm. I didn't investigate that um, my yes I, I i'm fencing in a garden i want to protect from the deer there i've got herds of them like <laughs> down yes. on scribner road there <laughs> sure. near the school so um can you move your microphone closer to you I'm thanks Ryan. Okay, go ahead so my motivation for the eight foot fence came from two sources one the photograph that jim showed you the the image it shoots um in fact, the fence that I'm installing currently or trying to install, uh, the materials came from the, the source that supplied shoots with their fencing material. It's a woven wire fence, eight feet tall. Uh, they supplied the posts, they supplied everything, more or less gave me a kit. I told them the, the size of the area that I wanted to enclose and they, they set me up with that. Um, my second motivation for the eight foot fence was a document printed, or, uh, published by the Monroe uh, County Cornell Cooperative Extension. Mm -hmm. And their first uh, bullet in there for preferred method of uh, mitigating deer damage to a garden is an eight foot fence. So that was, that was enough for me. That's what I went after. Began installing it uh, uh, in stages just as time allowed. I have, like Jim said, I have the fence posts in currently fencing is not installed um, and a week and a half ago is when I got my violation from the town inspector saying that the fence is taller than the town allows uh, okay. that 
led to a oh, three or four iteration back and forth. Uh, I copied Jim in on most of my correspondence uh, to the inspector and uh, just on Monday, uh, there was a concession from the inspector saying that, yeah, I have a point regarding the, the definition of, of farm purposes uh, in the, the particular clause that, that limits the height to six feet. And in fact, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read that paragraph. Um, so it's section 250-7.1 uh, describing fences, hedges, and screen plantings. No fence, solid hedge, or solid screen plantings over three feet in height shall be erected or maintained within 20 feet of any front property line, nor shall any fence be constructed greater than six feet in height above existing ground level. So the three foot one, I'm not in my front yard, I'm not close to the front uh, property line, so that doesn't apply to me. <coughs> um, however, there's a, the clause that says no greater than six feet. The pres but then the next sentence is, the provisions of this subsection shall not apply to fences on premises used for farm purposes. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm enclosing a garden, clearly a farm purpose. Um, the town code book has many sections, as you're all well aware. <laughs> Some of them include uh, a glossary, uh, defined terms and all that. Nowhere is farm or farm purposes defined. Uh, as Jim mentioned too, there is a customary agricultural operations. That, that there is a definition for that, but um, I'm not claiming anything related to customary agricultural operations according to the uh, code book. All I want is my farm purposes, uh, <laughs> the garden to be protected. And so I'm saying that the violation that I was called out on doesn't exist, um, and again, the, this really isn't the matter for the Historic Preservation Board other than the fact that uh, you guys do have something in your, uh, in your, your charter that says uh, for historic properties, uh, anything exterior or the, the public mm -hmm. view of the, of the property, uh, sure. you guys have jurisdiction over, and that includes fences, siding, uh, and I believe <clears throat> gardens may be listed right. in that paragraph also. So Jim invited me here tonight to, to talk about it because my property, in fact, is, is a historic landmark. Uh, and am I doing something wrong? No, <laughs> no, no, you're not. Uh, You'll fix it. So, so here I am. Uh, sorry, the, the last correspondence that I did have with the inspector as Jim mentioned, said that if the historic town or if the historic preservation board gives me the okay, then he really doesn't have any leg to stand on anymore that, uh, that I can go ahead with my fence. And I think Jim's looking to you guys to perhaps give me some words of wisdom on that. <laughs> However, I will qualify it that uh, doing my homework as I did what I thought this whole fence issue in the first place, Jim provided me with some, some literature of, regarding my house and when it was originally uh, declared a landmark back in 74. Four, right. Um, and so the, the previous owners, the Halls, they were the ones that petitioned or uh, signed over the, the had it declared a prop, uh, historic landmark. Um, Mrs. Hall, I guess in a subsequent visit, there was somebody from the Historic Town Preservation Board went and discussed what area goes along with it because I'm not in a historic preservation district. I'm just a landmark. Right. And, um, and this actually was a bit of enlightenment for me, uh, the, the fact that in previous uh, meetings where I've come to the Historic Preservation Board, we've had discussions, and this goes back to when Mr. Shaw was on the board, and um, he, his, his, his opinion, his, his view was that because of how the, the landmark was designated, it was only my house that was part of the historic landmark designation, that none of the grounds, could, in addition to the, the house, my property has a a large gambrel barn, a garage, a studio, well, what the halls used as a studio, but 
I found out it was a pig barn originally behind the house. Uh, so I've got four structures on the, on the property. Um, and again, previous interaction with the board, they all told me that it's only the house, the barn, um, should they fall down, which unfortunately part of my barn has fallen down already because of weather and stuff, but um, put a new roof on the rest of it, so it's all in good shape for the moment. Um, but again, I was convinced that it was just my house, which again would make it a moot point, me being here discussing a fence in my backyard. Um, turns out that's not the case. According to the paperwork that Jim provided me, the halls worked with the town board at, or the historic preservation board at the time and, and made it such that my property from the north border to the north face of the barn, from the street to back to and including the, the pig barn is part of the historic designation. So, so that, again, that was news to me. That's something that, that I didn't know about. And, and that's part of yet another discussion that I wanna, or another topic I wanna bring up. But um, that means that you guys do have jurisdiction over some of my property. So turns out that where I have the garden currently staked out and where I'm doing that is behind the, the pig barn. Um, so again, in my, my argument here, you guys have no say over what I'm doing back there. So, so pound salt or whatever and uh, let me be, but um, that's where I stand. That, that's what I know about fencing and um, Jim, did okay. I cover enough material? Well, so I think you did. You covered everything that we talked about, and it was accurate. Thank you. Uh, you're saying that that garden is located in the back of the property. It, it is not going to be seen from any side of the street. If you, if you're at the street and you know where to look, there's one sliver where you can look through between the house and the barn, and you can see the, the fence post currently. Um, so yes, it would be visible, but again, it's, it's a five acre lot. Um, my lot is shy of 500 feet deep. Uh, the, the fence or the garden is back on the order of 300 feet or so from the road. Well, but I do, guess do, I don't understand. Yeah. Do we have the paperwork? I, I, don't, I don't know how we would decide no, that. This, this is really a, this is this is really a discussion. It was meant to be a generic discussion because I really didn't want to single him out. This was more of a, what would we right. do in any case like this? But he was good enough to come in tonight um, to explain his position. No, I understand. I, and I understand what you're saying, except I don't think that any of us, without going through the timeline of what mm -hmm. happened historically, you know, from 76 forward, could really determine if we have the authority without yeah, uh, you know, that's, looking uh, at the, the if documents. the building inspector said to him, if the Historic Preservation Board yeah, approves of it, sound right. well, if it's not in the designation, which I'm a little confused over right, right. now, but if the pig barn is the um, borderline of what we're looking at, and this is behind it, I, I don't see... I don't see that we have jurisdiction, number one. And number two, we've kind of put him in a bad position because he's been told if we approve it, he could have it. So and it doesn't make sense to me. I, we would be, it's also <clears throat> beyond this particular case. I mean, we, we want to solve your situation also, but we don't want to set up an ambiguous precedent mm -hmm. Where, like, what size lot does it actually apply to where somebody can have this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, farm use, this garden and a fence? And what kind of fence? I mean, I don't think it's an easy question without first getting the background information, don't you think? Well, uh, yeah, but if the, if the designation, if we, we assume that he's done his homework and the designation is clear that it, it stops at the back of, this, of the studio, I call it the studio because that's where I used to play when I was a kid. It was in that, that building. Yep. It was where we played pool. Um, but if it, if it ends at the back of, the, of that building, then it's not, we, we, it's not, it's not for us to deal right. with. Right, exactly. It's, so, But we had to somehow have that conversation with the, the building whoever inspector. inspected it. That, I mean, that's fine. I mean, if, right. and that's, that's why we're here, to figure out how to handle this. Um, 
Uh, and just just so that I can clarify this, Ron, um, I've got on the on the um, TV yep. your property. Am I correct? And the way I interpreted it was the, it was the north face of your barn is where the district or is where the designation ended from the north property line southward to include your house then to the north face of the barn. Correct, but then it also goes on to say that. So discussion there with Mrs. Hull led to the agreement that the property from their north line to the north side of the barn right. and west to include the old pig barn currently uses studio would be designated. And this is the pig barn here? Correct. Okay. So I so, my so anything from this point to the north face. Yep. That would be what was designated. So the remaining portion of the property is not designated. Mm -hmm. And where is the garden with those? So to the top left of the the plot. Um, Jim, move your cursor. I just have yeah, right somewhere. There, right there. My eyes aren't right here. Okay, so that's so that's not our jurisdiction. <clears throat> right. How far off the property? That's why we want to talk about it. How far off the property, north property line, are you moving inward to the uh, fenced it's area? It's on the order of 45, 50 feet from the north okay. property line. So that's very helpful that uh, it is not in the designated area. So you're right. You do not have jurisdiction in this matter. Right. I, I don't, I'm not quite sure why. Because at would. this point in time, we didn't know that until we right. started looking right. at this. So the quote from the inspector, therefore, we will not take any further, <clears throat> excuse me, enforcement action on this fence issue until the Historic Preservation Board meets on October 7th this week and comes to a determination <clears throat> as to if a garden fence greater than six feet will approved by them for this property or not. So the answer is the board doesn't have jurisdiction over it, so it doesn't matter what we say. What the process yeah. is. Right, but then who would, because... The building inspectors have to then. But they have to make that determination. But is They just wanted to make sure that if they said he could have one and you said he couldn't, that would have put them in an okay. awkward situation. But I, I just, out of curiosity, you said the our fence ordinance says you can't have more than a six foot fence. It, so, is, is it relates to doing the things that you want to do around your property, but is it relates to agricultural activity? It doesn't say that. It says that you can do more than that. And that's what they were wrestling with. If he was, if, if, his, okay. if this area was actually in a designated area, then you would have had to have made right. a determination whether or not it would, you would have approved a six foot or an eight foot fence. No, I, I misunderstood what you said. I just, I thought you had said originally that like you needed some kind well, of... Well, no, and as I said, I wanted to keep this as a generic matter. I didn't really want to put him on the spot for it, but he was good enough to come in, and um, now that he's here, it's good to know right. that that's the situation. Jim, what do you do about uh, now that the town allows all these places to have chickens? Is there a fence requirement for that? There, there is fencing requirement, but it, it's not over six feet in height. Okay. So. And there are, uh, there have chickens. been within... Um, Certain areas that has chickens have There's not been allowed. Requirements and all it depends. Of you can't have them in, in, in like regular the, suburban. Like height, so right. What, is, what, did, what did the Cornell people say as far as the fence? Eight or six? Eight, Eight. is what they recommend. The it was the first paragraph in his submission to us. Okay, so what I'd like to do. I think they got to reevaluate the ordinance. Yeah, yeah I do too. They say they can. No. What I'd like to do is meet with the building inspectors, and certainly Shannon will be here as a witness for us, meet with the building inspectors tomorrow morning to make sure they understand that you do not have jurisdiction in this matter, in this particular case. Right. Um, you may in another situation somewhere else, so that's why I was trying to keep it somewhat generic, but the fact that he did remind me that uh, that portion of that property is not the designated area. Yeah. Or do we know the if there are any eight-foot fences in I, resident in places that aren't a commercial uh, I, I don't and uh, certainly you know if, if they pop up we're gonna have to address it um, uh, the one that's on the corner of uh, Atlantic and Scribner number one it's not an historic site or designated site uh, and I don't think that that's eight feet per se but there is a uh, archway that he built that might be higher than six feet so I don't think the inspectors are concerned about the archways they are as much the fencing but the fencing appears to be compliant um, so we will meet with the building inspectors tomorrow morning, of which you are one, 
and we'll discuss the matter in more detail, but it takes you out of the mix, which is good for you. <laughs> something out for you to think about? Please. Are you thinking about <clears throat> the fence that was just like in the picture it shoots? Yes. That, um, <clears throat> that's good for keeping deer out of their apple trees, mm -hmm. but you're going to have crops on the ground, mm -hmm. so you're going to be inviting rabbits and ground oh, hogs, so mm -hmm. you'll probably need smaller gauge um, fencing. So it is a graduated fence. The spacing is much smaller okay. at the bottom, and for that purpose. And is part of it <clears throat> underground? You know, like is. So the fence isn't installed yet. The, the, the land that I'm placing the fence on isn't perfectly level, so <laughs> I, want the, I want it to look good. Um, so yes, part of it will end up being a few inches underground. Um, you're I mean, thinking don't, for- Doesn't Cornell also recommend that a, a portion of the fence be buried so they're not digging underneath it? There are, yeah, there are recommendations like that too. Okay. I was just curious. Right now, so we've had, my daughter's tried to raise tomato plants uh, in various places <laughs> on the yard. <laughs> and, exactly. I mean, right outside the front door, and they, they come and chow those down, so. Um, I, I don't a, know what the chipmunks eat, but if they eat tomatoes, but they go under anything. They haven't touched, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Before we let you go, and we're going to let you go, <laughs> you no, can no, go I'm home and have dinner. Yet. Uh, a while back, you guys uh, got your approval to put a new roof on, but you never did it. Is there an update on that? Or? We haven't done it yet. Uh, it's still a, on the to-do list. Um, sorry, that that's as good. I'm as just good. curious. I, you don't have to go do it, but I was just no, curious it, to where you were with it. it. We need. Well, it's not urgent yet. We will be doing that in the next year or two. Um, so we're going to see each other again somewhere here in the near future for a, for a modification of the house. Uh, garage has been an issue, um, okay. and we'd like to do something about that. And uh, we're talking, well, we have a, an architect under hire to, to talk about concepts and uh, options for building a garage closer to the house, okay. possibly attached probably attached and that'll obviously need your approval. Um, do we, it, it refresh my memory, did we approve the roof, I think? Yes. 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 Okay. Yep. Do we still have that restriction about um, doing, if it's approved, that the approval has to be you, uh, activated uh, within we, a period We haven't of time. done that because there's been such a problem with materials and everything else, trying to get things in place. Uh, right. We, no, we, I, we, I'm not saying that. No, we, we, we just haven't. I'm I mean, saying we've that, given them the opportunity. The board made right. the decision to do it. Once it's made, we don't we don't renege on that decision until you know, unless they want to change it or do something. Something. Different. Okay. I'll give you Same that courtesy thing, one time. Oh, right. so. I just want to make sure you wouldn't oh. be caught short about <laughs> not you. saying what needed to be done. Very good. Did, was there something else? Yes, as topic? a matter of fact. Uh, so Jim was good enough to provide me with some documentation. In fact, he's the one that uh, gave me this document that explained the, the limits of my historic uh, landmark designation. And your previous discussion uh, about things to do in the coming year. Uh, the, this Jim handing me this piece of paper and or providing it for me, something that I wasn't able to find on my own. Um, I don't, actually, one of the questions for Jim, where did this come from? What I had to do is go back into our, we have a, a scan system that has all the minutes of all the boards. Um, okay. It's in our computer system. I went back, once you, once you told me that it was 1974, I was able to go back to the board's minutes in 1974 and scan the address, and once I did that, it pulled it up. I didn't know about it either, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> oh, I'm grateful was, that you were able to come I up with that. I was surprised that it, it was there, uh, the way it was written. This information, uh, Ms. Knauer has a, a nice section of all the landmarks, uh, folders for each mm -hmm. house, mine included, uh, in the library, and this wasn't part of that. I, I think I copied all the material that was in there, uh, again, not having this and not knowing the, the extent of the landmark designation, I was led to believe, given the conversations with Mr. Shaw and previous interactions with the, the board, that it was just the house. And again, had that been the case, um, there really wouldn't have been a reason for me to be here or for the inspector right, to cite right, the, right, the okay. historic right. designation thing. Um, so what I'm going to 
offer up as a suggestion is to somehow make this publicly available. Um, I, in my opinion, that's something that I should have been able to search and uh, retrieve on my own for these purposes. Um, the other thing, and along those lines then, um, I don't think there are that many landmarks or designated landmarks in the town of Penfield where this would be a, a burden, but um, something that I think would be good in terms of community relations between the, the Historic Preservation Board and the, the landmark owners themselves is to communicate with, with us. Uh, let us know that, that you're here to work on our behalf and to, because again, in my case, I did not know any of this information. Uh -huh. um, put together a package, if, if it's a new homeowner or even right. for existing homeowners. Here, this is the information that we have on your house. This is how it's been designated a landmark. Uh, th this is, these are the rules you have to live by. This is what you can or right. cannot do. And, and that, that's all, in my opinion. Uh, well, that would fall into what we were talking about, education. Right. But we did, what year was that that we had, we finally got it put in the um, deeds? Yes, that's a good point, Ron. I, I can't remember if it was uh, the homes themselves. Or I think they were, but right. it, no, was it, really, was it, was, it was really the frustration of the Five Mile Line Road uh, right. situation where they identified all the properties on Five Mile Line Road. I don't think they did the individual no, homes. We'll have to go back right. and look. Yeah. But if they didn't, it'd be a good we reason to do it. Because we were finding that whether realtors didn't know or whatever, it was not explained to people ahead of time. We went in and we got that, everybody's address and we recorded that in the miscellaneous records uh, section of the town of the county clerk's office so that when somebody does an abstract search, that pops up now for it. And they know that their house is, at least before the closing, they know their house is, is a designated home or it's in a district. So it is a good point, and we, we probably should be looking at doing that for the individual designated homes as well versus just the district. It's a very good point. Well, again, uh, I can't believe we even thought about that. Just the knowledge that, we're, that <clears throat> I'm a, a designated landmark is one thing, but then to, to know the extent of that designation, right. that, that's the part that, I, that that's... We should pull up that wording again. I, I don't really remember what... I will. Uh, okay. I'm going to pull up his wording for you, too, just so that you have it. But there okay. are, <clears throat> and, and again, a lot of these were done before I was here uh, in terms of interacting with the board, so I don't really know offhand a lot. I, I never would have known that unless you had asked me to look that up for you. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we need to go back and look and see what the board back in the day did in 74, because they did a lot of them in 74 and 75. For, they were very active. Um, we'll have to go back and just see what was going on with these homes. Um, I think all the individual landmark homes, we should do that. Yeah, right. And then also, it, he brings up a good point, um, put together a packet for new homeowners to say, hey, this is, right. uh, this is what your rights and responsibilities are as an owner of a designated home or in a district. And that's even a topic for a forum with present owners. Absolutely. If you're ready to sell your house, uh, it, you should inform your realtor you who's realtors. marketing right. you it. You think you get the realtors aware of it. Right, yeah. that's what I'm saying. We can't contact every single real, you know, we're, I don't know how, I guess you could send to the real estate board, but by, you know, everybody trying together to get them aware of what their requirements are, maybe it will change. Of course, you know, people are skeptical of buying a house with too many restrictions. So it takes a lot of education to understand um, what it is, you know, how restrictive or non-restrictive it is. There is a map on the town website of historic landmarks. And now if you um, move your cursor over that, a picture will pop up in a description of it. Can it, I wonder if the description of the designation could also be attached to that. Then it would it be. could be, but I, I do like the idea of going back to the county clerk's office because that's, be. that's the catch-all for everybody. Um, it should be in miscellaneous records. It should be in miscellaneous mm -hmm. records so they can pull that up for the... Well, it already or, is for Five Mile Line. Yeah, yeah. but I think we, I think we need to expand the, it to include One of the projects properties. for 2022 might be going back to all the individual... There aren't that many. I mean, it's right. not like we have thousands of them. We have right. 20 maybe. Sure. Uh, it would not be hard to go back and, 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 and do, do that list and get that uh, recorded as well. Right. I think it's a great idea, actually. 
It's kind of surprised we stopped when we, we did the uh, five-mile line. Well, it took line. a long time. But the problem is we had a lot of turnover on the five-mile right. line area, and they were all going crazy not knowing that they were there. So right. stop that <laughs> issue. Good points. Anything else? Actually, given your discussion earlier, too, there's two paragraphs that I'd like to read off of this one that, that's kind of enlightening, if nothing else. Plans were made for the presentation of bronze plaques to the three places already designated as Penfield landmarks. Ms. Hall will receive one at 1689 Scribner, Mr. Her Heineman at the Daisy Mill, and Mr. and Mrs. Inman at uh, 2204 South Five Mile Line Road. Mr. Starks, somebody that was on the board, I believe, plans to pick up the plaques when on a trip to Seneca Falls on Friday. He will be, he will be at each place to present the plaques when the buses of the Heritage Tour arrive there on Sunday afternoon, April 3rd, 1975. <laughs> so a bus tour of sorts that took people around to the... Yeah. Tom, do you remember 1975? I don't. <laughs> uh, I remember it. I was up the street, but I don't remember that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, uh, what it says is everyone's mm. supposed to get a plaque? <laughs> well, they did. I, they all did get a plaque, and his plaque is on his home. It's over okay. the door, So they all do. Door. Everybody's got what Everybody's this always gotten a plaque from this board when they were designated. We've done that for everybody. Sounds like these were the first ones, though. They were. That was the, 74, I think, was the first year they actually started designating homes. The, the, they just created the board right before that. Right. It was in its infancy at that point in time. but. But yes, we have, and we've done that with the, uh, right. the uh, And I Yellow remember Cafe, reading you know. in something from the local <clears throat> history room about uh, Mr. Myers, the first uh, chair, actually went door to door on Five Mile Line. Yes, he did. He created that district door to Personally to everyone, um, you know, what he could. Uh, and actually, I uh, always felt like it was big shoes to step in because he worked so hard and I was his replacement when he moved to Pennsylvania. So that's 30 and, years ago. And that's why there are no advertising fees or, or any right. permit fees for, for this process because that was the one thing that they had was they did not have to uh, ask for funding uh, to go through the processes, right. which I thought was smart. Right. <clears throat> Well, thank you for bringing all this to our attention. You're welcome. It will help our planning process, and I think Jim will take care of whatever we'll meet tomorrow needs with to the be building ironed out. We'll, they'll get back to you. Thank you. And take a picture of your tomatoes when they grow. <laughs> and when you harvest next year inside the fence. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Okay, so we are, Do we don't have any um, held items. Right? No. And we've, um, other business is what we were just discussing, correct? Uh, well, it was new business. Yeah. New, yeah. Business. new. I'd written oh, it in you were already you. down to yeah. 10. Yeah. Um, okay. So then. You want to talk we, a little bit about your climate article? Yeah. Do you, did. I, I have it right here for the. Right. If they want. And I would, um, I think it's, Kathy, would you mind oh, explaining? Yeah. It was a, a, a webinar, right? Right, given by the um, National Trust as part of their Pass Forward Conference. And um, I just thought this would be something helpful because there's a lot of resources, whatever you happen to be looking for, um, as far as climate change and how it affects different, different parts of preservation, you could go to those. Um, sites. The websites and right. find out what's there. And I looked at, I, I can't say I read, I clicked on every one reference because we don't have oceans or things like that. But on the, um, I think it's page four, it's just a four page document. In the middle of the page, there's something called sustainability. And under sustain, sustainability, I think there was a lot of information that could be used really regularly. Uh, the uh, the preservation brief number three uh, from the National Preservation uh, Society, improving energy efficiency in historic buildings. And it gives a lot of examples of how people can do that. The other one also discusses, and this 
you know, we, we seem to have endless questions about roofs and what, <laughs> what kinds of roofs are good for historic buildings. So the next resource is a technical uh, preservation service bulletin includes guidance, technical information, and case studies, including guidelines on solar panels on historic buildings and green roofs on historic buildings. Now that one has not come up yet where somebody wants to plant you could put your garden on your roof, but it might <laughs> yeah. at some point. And then it, it also gives um, <clears throat> building types in different climates um, and what can be done for with uh, historic preservation in those buildings. And then, so it's, it's just four pages of resources you can click on depending upon what the subject is that comes to the board about the the energy efficiency obviously includes you know what you should do on different sides of the building you know the hot and cold side the the lining the the roof the windows all, and that's come up a lot i mean with uh mrs wind's uh property talking about that kind of, so uh, Kathy's idea was she sent it to me, and I completely agree with her. It is something that people on the board should look through, be aware of, and you know, when we need it, call it into play because it's very current. Um, they give a case study of Charleston, South Carolina, which was just I just read someplace was voted the number one. Uh, city in the United States for preservation and they're, you know, how they're keeping up with uh, current trends. So that's, does anybody have any questions? And you sent out the link or? or I sent it to the board. I got to get one to uh, Shannon, but the, the, board's, it had, the board has it, yes. I okay. sent it out today, actually. So right, and you got, you I not have copied you on the, it also yeah, yesterday. But the okay. board did receive that. All right. Um, the only thing I have left for you uh, this evening, well, two things. Uh, uh, it's not a, it's a new business issue, but it's just more informational item. Um, you brought the wind property. The, the wind property is going to be sold soon. And it's going to be sold to a young man um, who's met with the town board. The town board, when it granted the special permit for Mrs. Wynn, the first condition of approval was it was not a non-transferable permit. All these special permits that the town board grants for commercial uses or whatever use, uh -huh. they're non-transferable, which means every subsequent owner has to come in and get that permit. So we're talking about the historic property, not her yes. personal no, property. No, we're talking about the historic property that you spent two years going through with them. Um, he has been before the board once already in an informal meeting to let the board know that he has uh, he's interested in the property. He has got an offer in. He wants to keep it just as Mrs. Wynn did it. There's no change other than the fact that he would like to put up a sign that says Ross Farm, which she mentioned to you when she first came in. Right, right. He will have to come here for that, but that's not a big right. deal. But he will be going to a public hearing on the 20th of October at the town board level. Um, I'm not anticipating any problem with it. He seems to be very, very responsible. Um, he does own other properties in the Rochester area, and they're well maintained. And and he has kind of the same thought processes regarding leasing as she did. So um, I just wanted you to be aware of that. There's nothing you have to do at this point in time. Okay. But they will be transferring the ownership and the operatorship of that property to him, and he has to get that permit as a condition of approval from the original grant. Okay. Does the property see owner? Does any are any of them um, historic? Or any of what? The property city oh, I'm not already aware. I don't know. He, okay. he, he, no. He actually is related to a former planning board member in Penfield who has since passed away, unfortunately, but he does have a good feel for what the town is concerned about okay. and what the neighbors are concerned about. So I think he's going to be a responsible individual to take over the ownership of that property and continue to operate it. So he'll be in. So if you get a chance uh, on the night of the 20th, uh, that public hearing will be uh, shown on Spectrum 1303 and 20 other places, uh, uh, but you can also, you'll be able to download it uh, the next time um, afterwards as well. October 20th? 20th. Okay. And then the only the other thing I have for you is I just wanted to give you a brief update. You've probably been wondering what's going on with the Clark House and, mm. 
and uh, the status of the Clark House at Town Board has been working feverishly <coughs> along with uh, members of the staff, particularly the DPW Director Eric Tate, to determine what needs to be done to, to preserve the Clark House and get it back into good shape for to be leased. And they, the town board had hired Bergman Associates to do a, a, a study of the building. Uh, they've been doing that now for several weeks, actually several months. Um, they've come to uh, a point now where they're going to go in and they're going to do uh, internal cuts into the walls, small cuts to determine what kind of problems they're running into. Obviously mold is a big issue on that site. Um, mm. Basement's got some big issues. There's a lot of wood rot, particularly around the uh, the base of the uh, foundation as it's, it extends north, as, you know, into the building itself. So they're going to be doing some testing here fairly soon before the end, the end of this month to determine what needs to be repaired and how much it's gonna cost to do it. So they have not been sitting back. They've been trying to move forward to get this thing resolved. And uh, it's just, there are just so many moving parts to this. There's asbestos uh, abatement, there's mold remediation, there's taking out old rotted wood, replacing it. There's a drainage issue on the east side of the building that has to be addressed, and we're working on that right now as well. But I, I wanted you to know that they are moving forward on that, and hopefully they'll, you'll see some work taking place there probably by the end of this month. Is there an interested time? There is, but the problem now is uh, how much has to be spent to refurbish the building, and is that person willing to commit money to help do that, or mm -hmm. is that person expecting just to walk into a clean building and, and do whatever it is he wants to do. So we are in contact with him. He's been supportive of staying with us through the process. Um, he has been looking at funding situations to help the cause. Um, but uh, we have a lot of work to do on that building before you could ever go into that site. So uh, you will start to see some activity taking place. Uh, you know, there's a lot of boards, collaborators that are coming off. They're rotted away. They'll, they'll all have to be replaced. And then the question is, do they use clapboards or do they, they use hardy board or whatever the case may mm -hmm. be? The other part of that is whatever they do, whatever they propose, they will have to come to this board for an approval. So you will be involved in this process. But right now, what they're doing is basically interior exploration of, of the walls and, and okay. uh, the flooring. Are they looking at the cart shed too? The cart shed is, it goes back to Ron, uh, Ron's comment. The cart shed, I found out, is not part of the uh, designated area. Oh, it's not for us, but, but in terms of- They are, yes. Needed. There are some structural things that have to be done at the cart shed. The cart shed's actually in fairly good shape. Um, there's an issue on the east side of the cart, uh, the cart shed where the foundations shifted a little bit. That has to be brought back into uh, line and um, some other minor stuff, uh, some wood rot around the front of the building where the columns were and all that. But generally speaking, that building's not in bad shape. Um, but again, it was interesting. Uh, the building, uh, and I had learned this through the architects that had been looking at it, um, the building in the front, the main house was built in 1832. There was an addition put on the back that was built in 18, I'm sorry, 1939. And then the, uh, the rest of it was constructed in conjunction with the uh, golf course. So a lot of that building that looks old is not is that not old. Um, but now the question is going to be, do we save all of it? Um, do we save parts of it, the, the truly historic parts that were not built in the 1980s? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they're wrestling through those kinds of things now. But it's all going to have to come back to you at some point in time uh, for whatever exterior modifications are proposed for is, that um, who's ever the potential person that's interested, you know, that's negotiating with the town, is he is he aware? Of, I don't know. I think it's still active, but the the uh, Rochester Area Foundation has that um, grant program. I think it's not he for municipalities. In, yes, but. he's been in contact basically with the um, the Monroe County Planning Economic Economic Development uh, Group uh -huh. that uh, provides funding. Uh, they've done a lot in Penfield for various businesses that have opened up here where you know jobs are being created. So. They've been in contact with that group, and that group's working with them on that situation now. So, Jim, does the does the town agree that um, that we have jurisdiction over a town building? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's already been discussed, and it's a, it's a foregone conclusion. It'll, once we know what is going to happen or what they're proposing, 
Uh, they'd be just like an applicant coming. But no, but if the town decides to take off a piece of the building, you would have to have they a, would come a certificate to of appropriateness okay. to do that. Yeah, there'd have to be rationales to do it. I'm not saying that's going to happen. No, no, no. But I'm there are saying, certain yeah. sections that are that are not old. I mean, they right. they're old now because that's they've been around since question. the '80s. But well, because the yeah. city but of Rochester not. does agree. Yeah. Even though it doesn't have to, uh -huh. it does go to yeah. the Town Preservation Board. Yes, that's that's not even been an issue. Everybody concurs that that has to happen here. So you will know as soon as we find out what's going to happen. I, I think at this point in time, most of the work has most of the work has to be done interior. Uh, uh, the exterior is probably replacing clapboards and fixing what's already out there in kind and not changing it. But the interior is where, where the money is being spent. I think at this point in time. And. Uh, I just had a, a, an interest question. We had talked about that property that um, is on the uh, top of the hill across the street from Gentles that backs into their property line, I think backs into the condos that's been vacant for years, sits back. Yes, okay. I know which one you're talking about. Is there movement there? Because, Not that I'm aware of. Well, they've got dumpsters all over the place. Well, that's good news then. Maybe somebody's going in and I flipping it or something. I wonder if, because you had told me that even I thought though that was he going, didn't. I thought that was going into foreclosure. I, maybe it was pulled out prior to foreclosure. That's good right. news. Right, so I don't know. We walked by there and I noticed a couple of dumpsters there the other yeah, day. I, I was so not much aware of that. So much deterioration on the, on the roof. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a historic building. I mean, I don't know what the year, maybe Kathy knows the year. Not off the top of my head. No, I know. I, I it, nobody it. seems to be aware of it because it sits. It's so far back off. It the sits road. back. That was the old Dolomite headquarters, wasn't it? Years ago. You I'm looked up sure. who the owner is. It was an individual person, not a. Um, and he's in his. He was when I asked about it a couple of years ago. He was in his nineties. Dolomite was on the north side. This building on the on the south side. Uh, yes. If you go up, it'll be on your left before you It's go on your it. left, and it actually doesn't face the street. There's a, a porch uh, with a, you know, a portico over the top that's falling this, over. This is the property you're talking about right here, right? It's, these are the uh, townhouses to the right. east, single family to the west, and this house is property. And, and, um, I think someone who works for the town lives in one of those houses. That was Peter Lyman's property. On the left side there. So it, it's comprised of 7.35 acres. It needs a ton of work, but I was it does. just curious at how old it is and if maybe he passed away. It's a 2,431 square foot home, so it's, it's a good size. Joan, home. do you know the address? Yeah, the address is. Um, uh, yes, I haven't written down at home, but 1075. I 1075. What is it? 1075. Okay. And he was paying the taxes and everything, but now you're saying it was going... No, I don't know. I, I, it's okay. been sitting there vacant for so long, I don't know what the status was, but I'm glad to see somebody's working on it now. I, we can check and see if a permit's been issued for any improvements. Not that I'm aware of. I, there's an open complaint for it. I know that. So I, I can check on that tomorrow and see if yeah, we've gotten I'm anything. Yeah, curious. Nothing came to me personally, but um, I can check on that. 1075? Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Jim, did you tell the board about the daisy flower mail? I yes. can't remember. Yeah, I've gone to too many that. meetings. Yeah, I sent everybody yes. an email okay. explaining what happened. It was unfortunate. Uh, they were ready to close on the property, and right before the closing, uh, they were fin finalizing their financing. And evidently, one of the one of the investors they had picked up because they couldn't do it themselves um, was out of state, and uh, the bank that they were working with did not feel right. comfortable going out of state, so they they did not do the closing. On the, uh, it's too bad. Yeah. Um, we'll see what happens. So very unfortunate. A lot of work was put into play by both by this board, right, and the town board and the staff. So it's the really fire department was there the day we, yeah. you and I were there. I mean, yeah. checking things. Out. It, was, and it does need work. It's, uh, it's something's going to have to happen there before too much longer. There are some structural issues that have to be addressed. Well, you saw those. Well, the thing has to come down before it right. ruins the that's hanging from the ceiling. So we'll see what happens. I'm sure they'll be marketing it again pretty soon. As Anything else? Yeah, I think, um, I don't know if any of you had a chance to go by Whalen and Five Mile Line, the fence we approved. Yes. Okay. Whalen and Five Mile. That's a good example why we should not be approving anything unless someone has a completed packet. Um, that fence look is so inappropriate. 
we approved it. It's a six foot high stockade fence. They're putting it in wrong. Um, right. It, it, I can't believe Ray across the street isn't yelling and screaming or the people on the other side. It We're talking about the one with the chimney that peels all the time. That the one, that, the, oh, the one yeah. that is a mud house, yeah. but it's been stuccoed over. Yes, I know. Um, yes. That, that's the biggest mistake. I mean, it, we should never be approving things unless we see actually what they're going to do and look at it and well they did show they showed the fencing they were proposing for yeah. it yeah they, they had the fencing and i went yeah. out and they showed yeah. pictures yeah. of the fencing you saw okay. we saw everything yeah. uh, it, but we it looks awful i mean it, well it's not it's, done yet and you are still right looks awful. they are I mean, they are putting the uh, decorative site on the inside versus the other from what, at least what i observed today i'm going to call them tonight mm -hmm. and say they've got to sit down even with when us. they fix it it is going to be it, it, it that corner, I mean, there's two very nice houses, and a church with a garden and everything, and now it's it's going to look absolutely awful there. Um, we did, we really should not have, we should have done a deeper dive on it. When you see it, it the fence doesn't fit at all with that with that whole area. Um, and this is again, and I guess this isn't the first time where I feel like we get things and we kind of are. Oh, the person really needs to start right away or something like that. That wasn't the case here. Um, as a matter of fact, it's, it's taken it, them quite a while to start. To, and it gets back to, to like Mrs. It. Wynn with the, with the air conditioners when you drive by there. She said, oh, that's where they have to go. So we approved it. And I think we're really, you know, when you go by that property and you see those air conditioners. She did, screen, she did screen the no, uh, one did. on the east, I'm sorry, on the west side. The, one, put, the one right by the driveway is not No, screened. it's not, but the one on the east and, side and was it, screened. Right. You know. So I, I don't know. I think we've got to have a little bit more. We've got to be a little tougher on some of these things because this this really ruin, is going to ruin the corner for those other three properties that have done everything right. Um, why can't I think of Ray's last name? Hutch. Hutch. Yeah. Like his house is so beautiful and the one across the street is so nice. And now they're going to look out on a stockade fence that is just way too big, way out of proportion on that lot. Um, and you can see it by just looking at the fence posts. That well, are they did. They did submit the plans. Yeah. Well, they're building. Well, I am assuming they're building what they said they were going to do. But right, right now, I'm concerned because I drove by today too, and I noticed that the structural portions on the exterior, and not the mm -hmm. interior of the building, so I, or the fencing. So I've got to talk to them about that. Uh, if they didn't ask for a taller fence, though. No, it's a six no, foot fence. They, it's a six foot fence. I'm trying to remember the material. It's a wood fence, dog eared. Um, right. So I will be talking to him about that. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Any time. It's time, Mike. I move to adjourn. <laughs> all in favor? <laughs> Hi. That's my that's my life. Thank you, thank you all for coming. Do we have anything? Um, Percolating for the. Uh, we don't have any applications. Uh, for the October. Again, we didn't have any applications for this one, but I'm, I'm glad we got got this to the is bottom October where we had to for be. The with November it. meeting. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I'm encouraging you to have a November meeting because uh -huh. number one, I want to get her plugged in and get her acclimated to the process. But secondly, we do need to start thinking about what you want to do for the next year. Right, and we can uh, maybe come up with some ideas for. Education. I liked uh, some of the ideas he came in with, uh, just making sure people understand what their rights and responsibilities are. 